message. Okay. I think we'll be okay. All right. Well, it is 5.30 as people are, are joining in and getting settled. I'll um, offer a few remarks before we begin. Welcome, everyone. My name is Megan Rust, Educator for Interpretation at the Frist Art Museum. Thank you for joining us for today's conversation with We Count artist Donna Woodley, Beverly Glaze Johnson, and Sean Giles. We'll begin with a land acknowledgement. The Frist Art Museum's building sits on land that Cherokee and Shawnee native peoples and elders call their homeland. We acknowledge and pay respect to them. We also acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to the ancestral land and water that support us. Today's conversation is presented in conjunction with the exhibition We Count First Time Voters. The exhibition was organized by the Frist Art Museum and is on view on our website at fristartmuseum.org slash we count. We'd like to thank the sponsors of We Count, presenting sponsor HCA Foundation on behalf of HCA TriStar Health. The exhibition is supported in part by Ryman Hospitality Properties Foundation, Neil and Harwell PLC, and O'Keefe Circle Level members. And as always, we appreciate the continued operating support from the Metro Nashville Arts Commission, the Tennessee Arts Commission, and the National Endowment for the Arts. Throughout the conversation this evening, we'll take questions from the audience. Please submit your questions um, via the Q&A feature below. You should see that button at the bottom of your screen. You can submit those anytime throughout the presentation tonight. And thank you in advance for your patience with us as we present tonight's program virtually. In the event of a technical difficulty, we'll work quickly to solve the issue and pause the presentation. If you're having technical difficulties on your personal device, please feel free to use the chat feature and send a message to Frist IT. Now, it is my pleasure to turn things over to the Frist Art Museum's Assistant Director for Community Engagement, Sean Giles, We Count Artist Donna Woodley, and Beverly Glaze Johnson, who is featured in Donna Woodley's paintings in the exhibition. Please join me in welcoming them. Hi, Hi. everyone. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Megan. Um, and thank you, uh, Ms. Johnson. Thank you, Donna, for being with us this evening. Um, and uh, just to, I guess, give people a little context, of course, um, the exhibition, uh, We Count, First Time Voters, uh, came about because we realized that, that 2020 would be the uh, 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which um, would give women the right to, to vote. And from that, we thought it would be great to explore uh, the history of voting and to look at some uh, current uh, and, and contemporary sort of stories around voting and early voting experiences. So thank you so much, uh, Donna and Ms. Johnson for, for being part of this. Um, and this is a sort of an open discussion. So I might lead off with questions. I might have a few questions, but um, we welcome questions from you all as well as the audience. So, um, I'll just start off um, and just ask just the general question. Why, why did you want to participate in this, uh, Donna? What, what made you want to participate in this, this project? Well, um, that, that is easy. Um, when the topic came up or the name of the show, We Count, came up, it was something that um, drew me in immediately. And um, just the, the layers to uh, what the show is going to be about. So seeking out people in the community who, um, who have very interesting stories uh, surrounded, um, surrounding voting. So that's what drew me in. Great. Um, and uh, Ms. Johnson, what, what uh, made you want to share your story? I, one, because uh, I'm very, very passionate about all things voting, um, without a doubt. And um, voting was something that uh, was instilled in uh, my sisters and I, very, very young. Uh, my father, who grew up in um, 
rural South Tennessee and Pulaski, Tennessee. He shared stories of his challenges during uh, Jim Crow and uh, trying to vote. Um, you know, one of the stories, uh, and I won't go into it, he frequently told about he and his cousin and what those experiences were like. And so as we were reaching voter registration age, he just uh, really encouraged us to get registered, but not only register, but make voting a very rich part of your life. He felt that voting was as important as, you know, as simple as what he would say as eating. And um, so, um, for me, there really wasn't much of a choice. Okay, uh, definitely understand that. Uh, and, and many of us come from uh, environments where voting was definitely encouraged. Um, so I'm, I'm interested, I think, maybe get into to Donna's uh, art practice a little bit uh, and just kind of think about, you know, uh, tell us a little bit about what, what you do, Donna, and um, maybe how your, your work on this project sort of fits into themes that you already work with. Well, um, I'm, I'm mainly, I like to call myself a painter. <laughs> um, that's really the majority of what I've done. I'm starting to get into some different um, media, um, like uh, photography and um, also a little bit of video. Um, but that's very new. Uh, but mostly I paint portraits. So um, I enjoy painting portraits. I enjoy people's stories. So my desire to, um, to listen and to engage people and to really take in everyone's story because I believe everybody has a story and everybody's story is worth being heard. That's the reason why I like to paint portraits. And so, um, what else? Yeah. I'm a portrait painter. I use oils. I like to paint large scale for the most part. Some of my work um, is on the smaller, smaller end. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, and I know we have a few slides. Uh, you can just let us know when, when you want to go through. Okay. Any of so um, we can jump right in. <laughs> yeah. uh. so, so of course, this is the work that you did for the We Count exhibition. Um, okay. And you actually, I'm not seeing. Oh, there we go. I see now. I'm with you now. Yeah. So this is this is one of the paintings um, that I made of Miss Johnson. There are two parts to the painting. So so the first painting is where she's young. She's I believe I want to say 17. Miss Johnson, is that right? From that picture you gave me? Yeah, my senior year in high school. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so that's the first one. And then there's the second one um, around the time, around now, that's a current picture. Um, and what I, what I wanted to do was I wanted to create like a timeline because I think it's spectacular that she's been engaged in um, social justice work really even prior to being able to vote. Um, from what we talked about, her story is um, very compelling. And the thing that caught me was that she said that she started out at one school that was in, um, in her community where she grew up, I believe in North Nashville. And then she ended up transferring to a different school. And this was as a second grader, if I'm not mistaken. And so, um, even in, in that young of an age, she, rec she recognized inequities between, between the two schools. And um, so that was something that caught on pretty early on. <laughs> and then it's just been, you know, her work ever since. So I wanted to create like a timeline of at least the age where she was about to start voting to, to now and just kind of show that dash, you know, you have, you have this year, you have that year, and then you have everything in between, which is the dash. Um, and then the, the, 
the the legal pad was more of a technical thing, I guess. I just thought it'd be very, very interesting to paint a legal pad um, and then write and then write on that legal pad just to kind of present this platform, if you will. Um, so that's kind of where that idea came from. But I wanted to represent her well and um, I wanted to share her story as best I could and also celebrate her just for her efforts and her hard work and dedication and um, being such a great advocate for voting. Yeah, thank you, Donna. Um, and Ms. Johnson, uh, Donna just alluded to it a little bit uh, and you talked a little bit about your experiences with the stories you heard. Um, I'm interested in, in knowing a little more about what you experienced as a child and what, what you saw even as early as elementary school. Well, actually, I was just a little bit older than elementary school, but yes, I, um, Nashville, uh, actually, uh, as, as Donna said, I am a native uh, Nashvilleian. I grew up in North Nashville. And uh, our uh, I don't know, I guess the school system, oh, probably around late 60s, you know, they started the process of integration and, um, and uh, eventually, you know, uh, um, desegregated the schools. And it was interesting. Uh, I loved my school because it was all that I knew. Um, uh, even after school, uh, my sisters and my friends and I, we played on the schoolyard. And um, I'm not sure what happened here. It dropped. Well, what are you trying to do? I'm sorry. It, it, it just, the video dropped. I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. I'm back. I'm sorry. Um, and so, um, but we were, we were sent to a school, bus to a school in a very affluent area. And it was just a stark difference in the resources that were available at our school as uh, in relation to what was, you know, what we saw there. I, I just, I, I could not believe it. And uh, there was um, just appeared to be better everything. Um, the layout of the building, uh, the distance to get there, location, and all of those things to me. And I was, you know, it was just, it was really uh, mind boggling for me as a young person. Uh, because, you know, my experience had been very, very different. Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I see we have some, uh, some Q&A questions coming through. Do we want to take any of those right now? Yeah, um, Ms. Johnson, someone wanted to know what school it was at, the school in North Nashville. Um, they'd be interested in, in knowing if you wish to share. Sure, I went to Ward. <clears throat> So at that time, it was Warden Elementary and Junior High combined. Thank you. I believe now the school name, it's changed. I know it's changed. It's now Churchwell. Okay. So Donna, um, what, what about uh, Ms. Johnson's story sort of inspired you? It was her passion for what she does. Um, the, her spirit, uh, the first time we met, I think we stayed, we, went, we met at Panera and we stayed there. I think we almost closed that place down. <laughs> I just love listening to Ms. Johnson. You know, she's just a wealth of knowledge and she, she can, um, you know, those, those people who vote, well, I, not, I don't mean to say those people, but, you know, sometimes we vote um, according to what we think is important instead of voting every single time. And so the people who fall under that umbrella, 
um, who maybe need to, you know, be inched another way. I, I feel like 100% that she's a person who can not, not even push you to do that, but just she'll make you understand why every election is important. She made me understand why every election is important. And I had recently just gotten to the point where I was, I was like, okay, I, I, don't, I don't know all the reasons why, but I know I need to be voting in every election, but she made me understand why. And so that was one of the things that um, I just was like, just sitting there like this, you know, <laughs> like, tell me more, tell me more. So yeah, that, that was the thing that made me um, very inspired by her story. Okay, so Ms. Johnson, what do you do now to, sp to spread the importance of voting, to spread that word? Well, I believe in, um, first of all, uh, I, I just like to start by saying voter registration is important, but to me, that's the easy, the easier part. Uh, it is important to me um, to, to engage in voter education because I, similar to what Donna said, she, her, her explanation is not unique. Most people, you know, vote because, you know, there is someone on the ballot that they want to vote for, or they vote because there is a buzz about someone who, uh, who, who, who's likely gonna be a good candidate, or you know, they vote because, or sometimes people will just call me and say, who should I vote for? And so that's why voter education, uh, first and foremost, is so important to me. Uh, because people really need to understand the candidates. Hopefully, they are looking at people who will respond to their interest. Uh, voter advocacy is important uh, to me, uh, simply because in Tennessee, a voter registration efforts have become so hard, so suppressive on so many levels. Um, in 2012, Tennessee passed the law for uh, that required the voter ID. And so there were some items that you could use to vote with at that time. And you uh, say, Sean, you were a new Tennessee, a new Tennessee. Well, you could use your license from your state. The very next year, they amended that law and said you could only vote in Tennessee with an ID from Tennessee. And so there's been other, uh, other attempts uh, to uh, suppress the vote. So these are the kinds of things and these are uh, that you not only have to talk to people about, but you have to work through the legislative chains to uh, hopefully write those or get those changed or you know, partner with groups and organizations who have the capacity to do to do that. Um, and then the other thing is uh, certainly, um, again, registration and uh, mobilization is so important because people will have their voter registration uh, and um, for whatever reason uh, will not go to the polls or may not have access to the polls. And so uh, that is just all of those things. Just there are so many moving pieces that make uh, an opportunity for a person to vote. And voting is a constitutional right. It shouldn't be this. It shouldn't be this difficult. But it really, really is on so many levels. Uh, well, I see can you I have. Ask a question, John. Yeah, yeah. So, Ms. Johnson, can I ask her a question? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. I just wanted to um, know, you know, with the, with that changing of the ID policy, um, what, what is the lot, what is the, the, the thought process behind that? Because it will have to go for, for the whole state. So is it a thing of an assumption? You know what I mean? Uh, an assumption well, that certain areas will have a harder time than other areas to provide whatever the new rules are? For sure, because I mean, there, there are different populations who uh, were very much 
and, and remain impacted by those kinds of laws. Uh, you take elderly people, people who, you know, were born, uh, you know, over, you know, I would say over 70 years ago, maybe, or even longer, uh, may not have a birth certificate because uh, many times they were born in rural areas and they were delivered by midwives and um, and that information was just not available. And it wasn't something that was even necessary. So there may not even be a record or a, or a correct record, I should say, of their birth on, you know, on file uh, in, uh, in the uh, vital statistics office. Um, my father and my aunts uh, often laughed about the area that they were raised in or their, none of their birth certificates had their birth names on them. You know, they, it, it was interesting. And so when it was time for them, and not only does this impact the opportunities for you to vote, but it impacts other things because when they were able to reach retirement age and to apply for their social security benefits, I mean, it, it took some work to untangle those things. And so, sure, and those, um, there are other things, uh, the access uh, to the voting, uh, they, um, you know, there have been instances when the polling places were, were closed or, you know, attempts to limit the time for early voting. And even more recently, when we had the tornado here in Nashville, uh, the state was uh, the, uh, the state was taken to court to extend voting election uh, the voting uh, the election for that day because they closed the polls early and we're in the midst of a cleanup and a state of emergency in 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 this city and other parts of Tennessee how insensitive is that um, in addition to that uh, to that it's I'm sure you all have heard the fight about voting by mail, uh, given we are in the middle of a pandemic. It may not be safe or conducive for everyone to go to the poll come August for the primary and then in November for the general election. So these kind of things. And so, so, so your question was, who do they really target? They target, target the uh, elderly, they target minority communities, and they target poor and rural communities, I would like to say. So I, I noticed we have several questions in the Q&A. Uh, Megan, if you wanna share some of those. Absolutely, we're getting some great questions. Um, several about absentee voting. Um, Elizabeth asks, in the time of COVID-19, how do we encourage absentee voting so that people can vote and feel safe to do so? Well, I mean, the best way to encourage people is to uh, uh, encourage them to go to the state of Tennessee, uh, the Secretary of State's website. There uh, is an opportunity or either their local uh, election commission's website. I want to assume that everyone lives in Davidson County like I do. And um, there is an opportunity to uh, pull down the request. You have to request an absentee ballot first. And you complete that and uh, in order to get your form. But again, you cannot request the absentee ballot. So uh, uh, someone was asking me about an absentee ballot recently, but they were not even registered. You have to be registered first. But you can also register on online. Yes, you can register online. And I put the link to do that in the chat. You can also check to make sure you're registered on the yes, uh, pn.gov too, and then request your absentee ballot if you would prefer to do that over voting in person. We're getting a lot of questions, um, Ms. Johnson, about encouraging young people to vote. We're seeing a lot of civic engagement um, with protests across the country. Many local voter registration groups, for example, have given up on college students because of disenfranchising voter ID requirements. This is from Pam. Um, so how can we engage these young people um, and get them to vote? I, I would recommend um, partnering with a organization who really targets 
or have the interest and the ear of younger voters and uh, allowing them to take the lead. There are many uh, around the Nashville area. There are, are some around the state. And um, because I, my concern, uh, while um, we are experiencing uh, the occurrences ar around and the events around protesting, and there are calls for a lot of things that I do agree with and believe are needed. But what I also believe is that there, the power of your vote at the ballot box is incredibly important. Absolutely. Um, another a question from another We Count artist that we have, Jerry Phillips, um, who's on. Hi, Jerry. Um, mm -hmm. He wants to know what advice you would give first time voters and young voters who are navigating the various candidates and platforms to better, better inform their vote. Encourage them to read. Under, uh, understand the can, yeah, understand who the candidates are and what the platforms okay. are. I would, I would encourage them to follow them on social media. I know younger people enjoy social media. I would also encourage them to read their information on their website, look them up. It's easy to find a lot of information about people via uh, social media and uh, just uh, via the internet, but also to take opportunities to go to local forums or hearing sessions where they may be discussing their platforms. That's great advice. Um, we have a question for Donna um, asking about your paintings of Miss Johnson. Um, Carrie asked, Donna, the perspective in these paintings is unusual and powerful. Can you talk about how that came about and what it means to you? Sure. Um, I, I do a lot of, um, the, the image is cropped and I started out, when I started painting, that's, that's kind of what I um, gravitated towards. So I thought it would be interesting to crop um, in, in these particular works uh, just because it would give a, a different perspective. I could, I could sit uh, the image of Ms. Johnson right there on the pad to look like she was standing on it. And, um, and then also, I think that the, the writing, the writing was a challenge, um, just trying to make sure that it looked like it literally was writing on a pad. Um, I hope that's the direction that, that the question uh, was going in. But, um, but yeah, so, so it was, it just kind of comes to me, I, I get the idea. And then I'm, I just go with it. And, you know, contrasting colors. Um, color choice. I work with a lot of complementary colors. So um, this background is like a really deep plum, which is in the purple family. And then you have a gold, the golden uh, pad. So those two are complementary colors. Um, it's just something about that literally the, the, they're entitled complementary colors because they complement one another. And so um, I think that that always plays a part in the uh, aesthetics of a of a work of art. Um, and then, yeah, just the painting of, of the figure is um, something that I wanted to kind of jump out at, at the viewer. So. Yeah, that, that's actually, I, I think that's a great question, uh, just because uh, it was one of, I, I chose the young uh, Miss Beverly Glaze as the, <laughs> sort of the lead image for the exhibition because I thought it was so powerful. And I thought it really summed up the idea of the show. So yeah, that, that's definitely something I've, I've observed as well. Thanks, John. So if we wanna, I guess, stay in the Q and A or? We got, uh, I think we've answered most of the questions so far, but if anyone has other ones, please feel free to put them in the Q and A. Um, we do have one um, from Mary who wants to know if you've ever had any bad voting experiences. I guess this could be for any of you. All of mine have been pretty, pretty decent. Yeah, and, and same for me. I've actually 
had very positive, very easy voting experiences uh, in, in my experience. It hasn't been an issue at all. Um, for me, I think for the most part, uh, my uh, voting experiences have been uh, relatively positive. Uh, I think that um, probably in one instance with the um, new, when the new voter ID law was uh, first uh, implemented, I think that some of the poll workers were a little confused and, and uh, were asking for other things. And uh, so, you know, I had a conversation with them that um, the law only requires you to have ID. You don't even have to have your voter registration card, actually. So, uh, so I, I think that's about it. Uh, we um, have, I've spent some time uh, along with my, with the members of my sorority. And let me just say, uh, on record as saying this is that I absolutely could not do some of the things that uh, I've been able to do without the amazing women uh, of uh, Delta Sigma Theta sorority. And uh, Donna's also, we didn't know it when I first met her. She's also a member of the organization as well. But we've had, you know, we've participated and engaged in many, many workshops as well as um, had some training from um, the Lawyers Committee on Civil Rights. And so they do a lot of uh, election protection. And, and so uh, I've had an opportunity to uh, serve at least twice as a poll watcher. And that's uh, a very important piece of advocacy because, you know, we, we know that there have been um, uh, incidents when uh, people arrived at the poll that there are attempts, there have been attempts to uh, disenfranchise them in some way. So I think in, in light of, of uh, those kinds of examples of attempts to disenfranchise, um, even beyond that, looking at our current climate, looking at uh, the recent uh, killing of George Floyd at the hands of the police uh, and, and the history that comes with that, um, the larger societal issues that feed into that, everything that you know we kind of deal with. Um, I guess Beverly, uh, Ms. Beverly, this is a, I guess, d directed to you primarily, but Donna, you can feel free to answer as well. How do you, um, how do you, I guess, encourage people to, or, or um, help people to keep, the, keep their faith in the process and in their elected officials when we know there's so much um, to, to worry about? Well, uh, that's why it's important to be informed <laughs> before you vote. Uh, and hopefully uh, you will, you know, you will vote for persons who will um, have your best interest at heart, your community, and making sure that uh, when these things are, are, when these things occur, that they are addressed equitable they're addressed fairly, and uh, they are addressed with urgency. Um, I would just say, uh, my mom always says, you know, you can't, you can't win if you're not in the game. Um, and I think that's a very true statement in the context of making sure you're engaged in the process and no matter what's going on in the world, um, mm -hmm. The fact that these things are going on in the world is even more reason to, to jump into the process and make sure you participate in many ways, voting, um, helping others vote, you know, in, in, in any way possible to get people to exercise their right. So, um, I mean, my gosh, that's the way that the change happens you know, if everybody does their part, so. Yeah, it does seem like, uh, you know, there, there's a lot to, to, to contend with. Um, there's a lot of reason for people to, to 
lose hope, but uh, it's also, I think, important to realize that this is a, in, in a lot of ways, is a marathon and, and not a sprint. So um, we can't expect to see uh, something change immediately, but we do want that sense of urgency. We do want um, people, we want to vote for people, we want people to serve who who can recognize and, and make changes as, as swiftly as possible. So absolutely. Uh, is there, are there any more Q&A questions I see? Looks yeah, like so uh, sort of in line with that, um, people are interested in um, partner organizations that can help people get registered to vote um, and what we can do to sort of um, help facilitate that, encourage people, maybe people that don't have easy access to register online, um, who's going out and, and making sure that we can um, get people registered and get them to the polls. There are a number of organizations um, uh, to partner with um, that. Um, is there a way that um, I can share that information and uh, Perhaps that it can be, you know, it may be posted um, at some point. I don't, you know, I don't know what, I'm not sure what happens beyond uh, this discussion, but sure, um, there, there are a number, of, a number of organizations. I mean, just to name a few, uh, the NAACP, um, the, um, the Greek letter organizations uh, often do voter reg registration. Um, there is an organization here locally called Equity Alliance. And um, gosh, I can't think of, there are just so many more. I mean, I know who they are, but uh, for sure, I'm happy to provide that information. Or if they will leave their email address, then I can email them that information. Yes, we've got the list of people that signed up today and we've, we've got some comments that people would love for you to share that information. Um, so yes, we can make sure that um, we're promoting that to those that are here and maybe even on our website or, or social media. I think it's such an important issue and we want to help do our part. So thank you, Ms. Yes. Johnson. Sure. We have a question for Sean. Um, Sean, can you share how this exhibition has impacted you? Sure. Um, well, I think most directly, uh, the most, I guess, the most practical thing I've taken from it is just a greater awareness of, of history, a little bit more knowledge about uh, vote, voters' rights throughout the years um, since, I guess, uh, the beginning of, of the history of the United States, uh, and, and just being more aware of how how that has evolved over the years, um, where it began with um, uh, white male landowners who were who are 21 years of age and has evolved into, you know, uh, uh, you know everybody who is a citizen, uh, barring some exceptions, being able to vote, and and still realizing that that there's there's some some hurdles along the way that that keep so many people from voting. Um, but just having that that awareness um, or greater awareness of it and, and understanding the power of that, um, and especially uh, as I get older and get more more uh, aware of things around me, more engaged in the process, just seeing all of that and being able to learn it as I go has been very impactful. Thank you, Sean. Um, we have another question from Stephanie. In light of the recent voting issues in Georgia, do we know if Tennessee is being proactive with ensuring um, adequate poll workers as well as ensuring everyone is aware that they can request an absentee ballot? I know that some people um, in other states have reported that they requested a ballot and never received one. Um, so do you have any advice about addressing those issues? I haven't heard of any incidents, but I, Tennessee was recently sued um, because of the, around the whole issue, issue of uh, absentee ballot or voting by mail. And um, more, more recently, just of last week, just as of last week, I believe it was, um, some of our uh, 
election officials um, were not going to, I under, as I understand, follow follow the court order, and so uh, they were strongly reprimanded by the judge who uh, issued the order, and um, and and the statement was that if people are not comfortable with voting in person during a pandemic, they absolutely have the right to request and vote absentee. So um, I have not heard, personally heard of any issues. Um, uh, we have until, I want to say, uh, you have, you, you, can, you can request, you may request an absentee ballot now. Uh, and you can request one up uh, 90 days before the actual election, but no more than seven days before election day. So if people are interested in requesting an absentee ballot, you still have time. You're still within in, in that window. Someone made the comment and I just wanted to, I saw uh, appear here, and I just quickly want to say, I think, uh, say something about it. You all asked, I think Sean asked the question about given the things that are going on in the country now, how do you uh, help people or talk to people about deciding who they're going to vote for? And someone put in in the uh, in uh, in the chat box or maybe in the Q and A. Um, that you know, one of the ways is to have one-on-one -on -one conversations with uh, with those who are running for office. Uh, I think the the comment was to call your elected official. Well, you wouldn't necessarily be calling your elected official if they are a candidate, but if they are incumbent and already in office, certainly I would place a call uh, to them if I wanted to have a conversation and kind of get a feel of you know if their interests. Uh, or what you need if it's in line with what their platform is. Just to share a little bit about absentee ballots, um, since we were talking about those, the deadline to request an absentee ballot for the August 6th election, which is um, coming up very soon. It's Thursday, July 30th, and you can begin requesting your um, absentee ballots for the November election, the November 3rd general election, um, starting on August 5th. So if you're planning on doing absentee, get those requests in. Um, Donna, a question from Mary about your work. Um, do you have plans to continue painting this theme of voting and activists? And I know you've included some other um, images of your work in this presentation. If you'd like me to show any of those, let me know. Oh, okay, sure. Um, you know, I think that I'm on to something, uh, Mary. I, I have been fortunate last year. I work in, I work a lot in series. Um, so, to answer your question, I can definitely see something um, along the lines of a series as far as people to to really recognize and to educate um, people about. Um, I was also thinking about, um, I, I had the opportunity to, to do a commission painting with Vanderbilt University of Dr. Dr. Dorothy Phillips, who she was the first African American woman to get an undergrad degree from Vanderbilt. And so um, I had the pleasure of meeting her and um, we, I spent the day with her and we started talking about um, other African American scientists who were women. And so um, that is like a list of, of things that I just, I have to do. And that that's one of them. So I could definitely see, um, carrying on uh, the series, starting with Ms. Johnson and, and um, seeking out other people to paint. Um, yeah, and it, I mean, I just, I included other images just to kind of show my path. Um, but I did want to talk, you know, I, I did want to have, make sure that the conversation was about voting because it's so important, you know, um, but 
Sean, should I, I mean, should I talk about my work or what, what do you? Sure, yeah. Are we going to continue talking about voting? <laughs> I'm good with, with whatever we need to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean I, I think people would like to see a little more about what you do. We can share a little bit of your work. Okay. Um, okay, yeah, like I said, I'm a painter and um, a lot of the times I am, really all of the time, I, I gravitate towards painting people. I involve my friends, my family, they indulge me, they um, let me do strange things to them, like put underwear on their heads, <laughs> as you can see here. And then I do strange things to myself, like put underwear on my own head. But um, a lot of the time in my work, um, I started out not really talking or not really wanting to veer towards talking about Black culture. Um, I didn't quite know what that was about, um, maybe just not wanting it to be like a typical path for myself. But um, as I attended school, I realized that that was something that was inevitable. And it was something that I was very passionate about um, on the inside. And so I just let go of all of that, uh, whatever that was, uh, that was hindering me. And I just went for it. And so in, in these works, a lot of the time, the things that are important to me are just ideas of the way that American society views Black people. Um, anywhere from a person's name to the way that they look or uh, the idea of feeling visible or invisible. Um, and then in the other, in the, the slide before, um, Megan, thank you. Um, th this series is about uh, the idea of black women Black women feeling invisible in American society and doing something so absurd to make yourself visible. But is that absurdity, you know, helpful? Um, so there's a tension between that visibility and invisibility. And then it also has to do with hip hop culture and the objectification of women. So there's a specific period of time in the 90s where rap music was really, really, um, really dogging women out, you know. Um, and so essentially what I did here in these paintings, these are granny panties. Um, I like to use a touch of humor in, in my work. Um, <laughs> but it just kind of, you know, generates a, a, a larger conversation. And so um, here, if we're talking about hip hop culture in that time period of the 90s with um, gangster rap and, and those types of uh, things, then it's, it's repurposing the underwear. So you're covering the eyes and you're exposing the, the, the parts of the body that the underwear are intended for. So, um, and then they're also, the names are also important, um, like Kanisha, the civil engineer, um, and Yushika and Shantae and, and coupling those with these um, prestigious careers. Uh, it, my generation, when I was coming up, it was always said to, you know, you know, make sure you name your child something that will get their foot in the door so they'll be able to get a job, you know, that sort of thing. Yes. Um, that is something that I have grown to have a problem with because um, a name is a name, you know? And so just like Donna is my name, Shantae is somebody else's name and, you know, so it, it, it shouldn't be an issue. So what I'm attempting to do is to, to even out, even out that, that um, or really just eliminate that stereotype, yeah. So um, I work, uh, anything that I name is gonna be, is, the name is always gonna be important to the work, so, yeah. Um, I would like to talk about the, the last parts, uh, the last images, Megan, if you don't mind going to those. I'll tell you, let's see, hold on. Okay, right here. So I think this is um, really key and, and relevant to uh, what we're dealing with today. 
and these murders that are happening. Um, I'm starting, I, I mentioned that I'm starting to work with a little bit of photography. So what I'm doing here, and this is new work, I'm taking um, family photos. And um, if the people in the, in the photos have since departed, then I'm eliminating them out of the picture. So here, this is my granddad, um, John E. Strong Sr. And um, he's, of course, the only one in the picture, obviously. So if you go to the next slide, then, then he's taken out. And that is a process within itself. It, it uh, as I'm in Photoshop and I'm working with it and eliminating and it's just, it, it, it really is, um, I, you know, you, I feel some kind of way about that. And so um, in the next photo, let's see. Um, so there's a little bit more, uh, more of a correlation to, to what we're dealing with now with police officers um, and, and their uh, murdering of black men. So this is from the left to right. There's my mom, um, who she should be on the call. <laughs> uh, there's somebody that I can't recognize in the back there. And then there's my, my mom's older, older sisters, my Aunt Hazel and my Aunt Helen. Well, my Aunt Helen had a son, Ron Settles, who was um, actually in 1981, he was killed by the police in uh, Signal Hill, California. And so um, it was, what happened to Sandra Bland is, is almost verbatim what happened to my cousin in 81. So he was stopped by the police and um, was taken in and he was essentially beaten and choked and choked to death. And then they hung him and made it seem like he committed suicide. And we all knew that that was not true. And so um, this is his mom, my, my Aunt Helen, who she's on the far right. And so um, not too long after my cousin Ronnie died, uh, she passed away. And it, it's, it's, there's a, a lot in between there that I, I know we only have a certain amount of time, but um she she essentially passed away from a broken heart because that was her only son and so if you if you go to the next slide then you'll see see she's taken out so um so yeah that that i'm 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 wanting to really tackle my in my own way these these things that are going on that just aren't aren't what need to be going on in America in 2020, you know? And so the, the work is, is called, for now it's called Memory and Reality. I have a tendency to change the name once something, something else comes that's better. <laughs> but for right now it's Memory and Reality. Um, so it just talks about, you know, these pictures are retro and um, they represent happy times, but then you take this, some, this there's, when that space is empty, then it just changes changes the whole tone of the the pictures. So, oh and oh, can we go to the next one? I I've already explained, but but my cousin Ronnie is the second from the left. So that's Ronnie. Yeah. And then the the uh, the extreme left is my uncle Ken, who he passed away a few years ago. So. So yeah, those those are um, those are the main things that I wanted to talk about, especially in the wake of um, George Floyd and the way that he died in such a vicious, um, horrible way um, to die, and that's happening. It's been happening, even I mean, it's been happening. So it's just something that um, it, it's a wider range. It's not just talking. My my work is talking about death in general, um, but definitely how trauma what trauma does to a family, you know, it, it leaves, it leaves, it leaves like it blocks, it blocks things out of your memory, I guess, to protect you. But then it also, there are specific things that you remember that happened um, that are, 
that they stick with you. So there, I was nine when that happened. So there are specific things that I remember as a kid um, about uh, my cousin's tragedy. And so I just wanted to work with that, work through that. Um, you know, for not for not only for um, for healing. You know, it just I think it'll provide some sort of healing and to many people, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah. Well, wow. thank you, Donna. That yeah. that's very powerful. And to see see sort of the the evolution of your work and see how you're going into to something totally different as well is uh, really a testament to to you and your ability to convey those messages and those images in a way that that sort of maintains that power. Um, so I see that we have more Q and A. I know we only have about five minutes, so. Uh, we have one question um, from Reagan about these works, Donna. Um, we've gotten several comments from people in the chat saying how powerful they are and, and thank you for, for sharing them. Um, Reagan asks, um, she says that this new work is both deeply personal and universal. Do you plan on reaching out to other families who have also lost loved ones to gun violence? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I was thinking about that uh, just yesterday, um, I'm also working on, I'm interviewing my family members as well um, in, a, in, vid in a video that I'm planning to put together. And so I would love to do this same process uh, with the photos for, um, for other families. Um, so I'm trying to figure that part out. Um, I, you know, I don't have the original, these are not original photos that, that I've printed but I'm working up the courage to ask my relatives to, you know, let me borrow their photos because I think that would also add a layer to it. But I definitely, um, Reagan, plan to plan to involve other families. I think that that, that will be the key to healing. Well, we have a couple minutes left. Um, do you do you, Miss Johnson or Donna or Sean, have any final thoughts about the exhibition or the importance of voting or the importance of um, sharing through art? I'll, I'll let you all go first. Well, I would just like to add uh, in closing again, uh, thank you, Donna, so much for. Uh, availing this opportunity to me, as well as the uh, folks at the uh, Frisk uh, Museum of Art. Uh, it's just super, super important because, again, given we are dealing with a pandemic, that we use the um, each one, reach one, teach one method, getting people registered, their absentee ballots, whatever they need to be present and accounted for in some way at the polls um, uh, during the primary and in November. Um, we, if we have elderly relatives, uh, relatives in um, uh, rehab or skilled care facilities, uh, please, please, uh, take it upon yourself to uh, don't uh, rely on others. Take it upon yourself to help get your loved ones what they need to in an effort that they may be able to vote. Continue to talk about voting, continue to encourage voting. Find a way if you can to get involved in the voting process. It is going to take all of us um, to improve uh, the numbers in terms of voting. And I guess just, just one other thing quickly. I am just concerned that our voter turnout and our voter registration is in Tennessee is quite low, but we still experience disproportionately uh, efforts again to uh, suppress and disenfranchise the vote. It makes no sense to me. Thank you. Um, in closing, I just want to say thank you, Ms. Johnson. I, I have learned so much from you, and I've had it, it's been an honor to 
to be able to involve you in, in the project. It was the best thing ever. Um, and so I, I love the fact that I got a chance to paint you and that you actually like them. <laughs> um, but um, I just appreciate your knowledge and your, um, your passion. And it is very important. Um, I just encourage everybody to become knowledgeable, read, figure out ways to, to help other people so that we can all vote if you are not in the game, you cannot win. Absolutely. And I just want to, I guess, uh, I'll just start by thanking you both, uh, Ms. Johnson and, and Donna. Um, thank you, uh, Ms. Johnson, for uh, your persistence in this issue and uh, really emphasizing the importance of voting uh, and, and really reminding us how much that matters. Uh, thank you, Donna, for reminding us how, how important art can be and what a healer it can be. Um, and, and for many of us, uh, these last few weeks, really these last few months, you know, uh, of being locked away in our homes, but especially the last couple of weeks, having a lot of ways been a collective trauma for many of us. And so it's, it's good to be able to to see art and to and to speak to people who are really uh, dedicated to to what they do, so so thank you both. I certainly appreciate it. Thanks, Sean. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you Donna, Sean, and Beverly. Thank, thank you all you so for much. joining us tonight. Um, Please feel free to follow The Frist on um, social media, visit our website, or sign up for our weekly um, e-newsletter to find out about future programs. And if you haven't looked at We Count First Time Voters on our website at fristartmuseum.org slash We Count, please do um, look at Donna's work um, and all of the other artists included in the exhibition. It's such a powerful exhibition and very important and timely as we um, heard tonight. Um, we'll be doing future conversations with We Count artists, so um, please check those out, and we um, look forward to seeing you all soon. Thank you so much. Really quickly, thank you, Sean, for, for asking me to be a part of the project. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Have a great night. Bye. 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 Good night. Thank you. <laughs>